Humankind has always wanted to soar amongst the clouds. So beautiful. And the winged creatures all around us helped make it happen. Through evolution, birds have found various features that optimize flight. We're continuing to study birds to influence aviation technology and the way we fly. That was awesome! Wow. While looking at a daring rodent to help formulate a fun way to jump out of the modern plane. I'm Danny Washington, marine conservationist, biologist, and thrill seeker. And this week we explore how, when it comes to airplanes, nature knows best. Innovators have been looking to nature for a long time, with birds and their ability to fly being of particular interest. It's no wonder that one of the earliest instances of bio-inspiration was the airplane. The pioneers of aviation started out looking at birds even before people had a hope of having any technology that would allow them to fly. Biomimicry has been been used a lot in airplane design and aviation experts continue to look to biology for inspiration on how to make their designs better and more efficient. Look up at the planes in the skies today and you may not equate those metal monsters to the natural exquisite forms of birds. I mean birds were designed with flight in mind from the curvature of their wings, their teardrop shaped bodies, right down to their lightweight hollow bones. It's when you look at very early examples of airplanes that these avian influences truly become apparent. Which is why we're here at Seattle's Museum of Flight to meet up with aeronautical engineer and airplane pilot Bernardo Malfitano. Wow, Bernardo, this place is amazing. I mean, there's so many old airplanes on display, and I really can't help but notice how, how many of them actually look like birds. Yeah, before we really had aeronautical technologies figured out, people were looking out at the world, at nature, going, hey, birds are flying, how does that work? It's fascinating looking at all the amazing airplanes here, all inspired by nature. This one, the first to have a vertical tail rudder, was designed in the 1890s by a German named Otto Lilienthal. The Wright brothers studied Lilienthal's designs when they made their historic flying machine. Wing is basically a scoop that deflects air downwards as the air flows by it. So the air going over the top of the wing wants to follow that wing curvature, so it gets pulled downward, so it pulls the wing up, and the air under the bottom of the wing gets pushed down by following the curvature of the bottom of the wing, and that pushes the wing up. That's exactly the same whether it's an airplane or, or a bird. So Bernardo, I know that bird bones are actually hollow. How does that come into play with designing airplanes? Hollow structure gives you the most stiffness for the least weight. So you see I beams in buildings and you have hollow bird bones. And if you can pull that off with airplane structures, we can look up right here. Hollow too. There's a skin on top and a skin on the bottom. And what's pretty handy about that is that we can fill up the wings with fuel and fill up the fuselage with people because you don't really need structures on the inside to give it stiffness or strength. Oh, so tell me about this one. So this is a glider. So one trick that we borrow from birds is that if you find a place where there's upwards moving air, you can fly downwards through that upwards moving air and not actually get any lower. You can fly up there all day without using any power. That's called soaring. So just like seabirds, how they fly over cliffs and waves and condors who fly over mountain slopes, I mean, they expend no energy while they look for food because they're soaring. Yeah, that's exactly right. And if you look at where people fly hang gliders or paragliders or, or sailplanes like this, it's pretty much the same thing. So tell me about this model in particular. This is the Perlan, and this was uh, flown by Steve Fawcett. And what he figured out is that, well, if you, if you have a, a ridge of mountains, that deflects the wind upwards as the wind goes over the mountains, which deflects the next, next bit of air upwards, which deflects some more air upwards. And what you end up with is a whole bunch of air all kicking up the next bit of air upwards. That's called a mountain wave, and it goes up to like 100,000 feet. So you can get in a glider and just ride the mountain wave up as high as you can go. So they, they went to about 50,000 feet, which is a world record for, for gliders. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> That's really cool. Bernardo, this museum has been amazing and you're so informative, but I have one more question. Yeah. I often see migratory birds flying in V formation to save energy. Yeah, the way that works is that if the bird is flying on the upwash of the other bird, it's like what we talked about with soaring. They're flying through upwards moving air and they need to expend much less energy to fly forwards. Can planes do that? You want to go try to find out? You bet I do. I'm That's in. <laughs> Each
Even though the very first successful airplane flight happened way back in 1903, innovators continue to look toward birds to make planes safer, faster, and more efficient. Aeronautical engineer Bernardo Malfitano has officially switched to pilot mode, prepping his team for an ambitious experiment. Behind every airplane and every bird is something called the wingtip vortex, where you have a little tornado coming off from each wingtip. But just outside of it, the air is moving up a little bit. Migratory birds fly in a V formation because each bird is in the upwash of the bird right in front of it. And they get some of that upwards moving air effect where it takes less energy from them to move forward. So I got an Invector Sports Star, which is a, which is a Czech light sport airplane. Very and nice. I got this airplane because it's basically the lightest airplane I could find. Hopefully any, any little effect that we can pick up from the Vortex will be able to see in this airplane. And what we're expecting to happen is if I'm, I'm coming up on the Vortex and we're starting to surf that upwash, we should pick up speed. And you know me, I'm going to be with Bernardo every step of the way. Bernardo and I are going to take off with and try to surf in the wake of a larger, heavier plane called an RV-7. in the air and at the proper altitude, both planes start to travel at a slow, steady pace. Speed is uh, 66 knots. And we position for the experiment. I'm going to start moving into the vortex. will be the first experiment. If it works at all, I'm going to break off to the right if I feel more speed. Now I'm going to start moving in. Let's see what happens. Pretty much behind the wingtip. Are we in the vortex now? Yeah. All right, we picked up a little bit of extra speed here in the sports star. Let me see if once I turn off to the right, if we if we keep it. Okay, we're at about 74 knots. Oh, there it goes. Oh, there it is. Oh, yeah, I felt that. So how's my speed? We creeped up a little bit to 75 knots. The sensation is subtle, like what you'd feel stepping onto a moving sidewalk at an airport. But the fact that we picked up one knot of speed proves that there's something there. All right, we're going to give it another try? Sure, I'll get in closer. Just a second. It's not until our final attempt when we decide to really go for it, and Bernardo decides to move even closer to the RV-7, that the effects become really apparent. Oh, there you go. Hey! hey. <laughs> now, that was awesome! Wow! Yeah. The feeling is hard to describe. The entire plane tips slightly and lurches forward, gaining about three knots, even though Bernardo provided no additional power. We found out it's pretty important to be pretty close to the other airplanes. We were really far behind. We didn't really know where the vortex was. So being right behind them really helped out get us in the, in the sweet spot. The fact that we pretty much hit it means that it's, that it's there, that it's real. That's Great. pretty cool. Oh, that was man. so much fun. Yeah, that was awesome. Yes, great flying up there. I yeah. mean, that was fantastic. It was, and, and I can't believe it kind of worked. Yeah. At one point, we're, we're forming up behind the other airplane, and you know, we started picking up speed towards it. And I banked off to the right and slowed down. And yeah, we were going faster in the, in the wake of the other airplane. Who would actually use this kind of data in the real world? I think it's mostly the military. So the military will sometimes have a, a convoy of airplanes, multiple cargo airplanes taking supplies overseas. If they're flying formation, then they're the ones who could benefit from each other's vortices. Well, no matter who uses it, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> Whenever you're developing any kind of technology, the first step is, is looking at nature, is learning about the world. Looking at the phenomenon you're, you're curious to, to harness or to replicate and say, how, how does that work? Nature has evolved. It seeks an optimum. So it seeks a better shape or a better muscular distribution or a better this or a better that. And that's what we're trying to understand. There's always people with clever ideas at universities or at big companies testing out something in the lab, going find something new. And you never know which of those things are going to be in an airliner in 10 or 15 years. It's not a 
given that we will find something tremendously advanced, but it's very possible that we will. Hopefully sometime soon, we'll be able to take to the skies more efficiently than ever, because we've always known that when it comes to flight, nature knows best.